finish up this chapter and then we'll start on the next chapter because we'll have Monday, Wednesday of next week and then as you know next week is the 12 week. We don't have class Thursday or Friday. And uh, then the next week is spring break right after that. And then when we come back we'll have that Monday and then we'll have Wednesday for uh, class. So we'll see sort of how far we get into the next chapter because right now we have chapter 3 and 4 in the test. So we'll, we'll just wait and see sort of how far we get into that. So I'll let y'all know about that soon. Uh, probably on Monday I'll let you know what to expect and how to prepare for that exam. Okay, let's try this quick test here. Uh, RC circuit consists of a resistor of 1 mega ohm and a capacitor of 4 microfarads. Uh, there's the voltage of the battery. How long does it take to fully discharge when it's disconnected from the battery? So you charge this capacitor and then you discharge it. How long does it take to fully discharge? about 10 more seconds, you know? Stop at 115, 115, just guess if you're not sure. All right, so um, the answer is going to be A here. So what you have to do is you have to find the time constant, which a lot of you did, because those of you who found the time constant find that it's 4 seconds. So remember my tau is equal to uh, R times C. And this isn't the time to discharge. This is just a time that sort of characterizes the circuit. So if I'm looking at a graph of a discharging circuit, it looks like this. This is that E to the minus T over RC function. Uh, and in this case, we're going to be looking at the maximum charge. That's our maximum value here. And as it's discharging, a time tau is going to occur roughly right about here. But the time to fully discharge is going to be somewhere out here. All right, so we find that our, our uh, time constant is 1 mega ohm times 4 microfarads. The mega and the micro cancel, 10 to the plus 6, 10 to the minus 6. So that's equal to 4 seconds. So that's why a lot of you put B. But the real answer is A that it actually takes a time of 10 tau to be either fully charged or discharged. That's a common thing in exponential functions, that you have this characteristic time that describes uh, how long it, it takes to discharge or charge. But I don't know, for whatever reason, we, uh, we use this 10 tau instead of describing that time as actually 10 times that RC. You follow what I'm saying? To fully charge or discharge, it takes 10 times that time constant. I'm gonna, we're going to skip this next part. Um, is that right? No, I think we can do this first part. This will be good. Um, this is up here. Yeah, let's do it. All right, so after 20 seconds, what is the current in the 2 ohm resistor? So what we have here is a circuit. Uh, we have this bottom branch right here, and then we have this top branch. We also have this in series. Uh, actually, let's say that we're just going to get rid of, of this resistor completely. It'll make it a little bit easier. So we'll just imagine that that resistor is not even there. So you have two things going on. You have this battery that is feeding uh, current into this, into this part of the circuit. And then we have a battery that's feeding current into this part of the circuit. Uh, now, this first part is pretty simple. After 20 seconds, the current in the 2 ohm resistor, what is that current going to be? 
it's remember uh, two parallel branches. So in the two parallel branches, they're going to be completely independent of one another. So even though the current in this branch is changing with time, the current in this branch is going to be completely the same. You follow what I'm saying? That is always going to be constant because this resistor is going to always be connected to the six volt battery. And so what's my current in this two ohm resistor? I have six volts across the two ohm resistor. It's going to be three amps. So I have uh, my current in this two ohm resistor. The 20 seconds is irrelevant because my current is always going to be V over R. That's going to be 6 volts over 2 ohms, so that's going to be 3 amps. So my current here is going to be 3 amps. Let's ask another question. After 20 seconds, what is the total current? All right, and the total current would be the current coming off of this battery right here. Now in this case, I need to know not only the current through this 2 ohm resistor, but I also need to know the current through this branch. So after 20 seconds, what is the current through that, through that branch? That's the question you need to ask yourself. What is the current through that branch after 20 seconds? Well, it's an RC circuit. I have a one farad resistor, uh, capacitor, one ohm resistor. What is the time constant for that? One farad and a one ohm. It's one second. So how many time constants have passed after 20 seconds? The one second, 20 times. It's 20 time constants have passed. So what is the current in that capacitor after 20 seconds, or in that part of the circuit after 20 seconds? It's going to be zero because for a charging capacitor, the current looks like this. If I plot I versus T. This is for a charging capacitor. Initially, the current is big, and then it uh, declines over time. After 10 tau, my current equals zero, effectively zero. It never actually reaches zero because that's the way exponential functions do, but uh, it will eventually get so small that we'll just say that it's zero. So at 10 tau, our current is equal to zero. That means after 20 seconds, the total current is also equal to 3 amps. Now let's ask a different question. What if, um, what is the total current after 5 seconds? Now in this case, how many time constants have passed? Just 5. So it's not fully charged, uh, so we still have current flowing. So what we need to do is find the current that flows in this branch at t equal 5 seconds. And that's where we're going to go to our equation sheet and we'll see that our current at some function of t is going to equal to I naught times e to the minus t over rc. Make sure that you know how to do the exponential function. I think that y'all probably do, but some of my other students don't. But just make sure that you can do that exponential function. Uh, because you'll probably see it on the test. But hopefully that'll be a give me question because the equations are all in the equation sheet. If you just know which equation to use in order to calculate the current, then um, it should be a fairly straightforward question. So here, our I naught, that is our initial current, is just from Ohm's law times e to the minus t over RC. Let's put in our values here. We had uh, 6 volts over 2 ohms. I'm sorry, not 6 volts over 2 ohms, 6 volts over 1 ohm. That is our maximum current. Y'all follow what I'm saying there? That initially, when I start charging, I have 6 volts across this 1 ohm resistor, and so my maximum current here is going to be 6 amps. 6 over 1 is 6 amps. 6 volts over 1 ohm, e to the minus t, which is going to be 5 seconds, divided by uh, our time constant, which is one second. So it's e to the minus five. Six times e to the minus five is uh, 
make sure that you can do this. If you don't deal in exponential functions, just make sure that you see this on your calculator. So uh, minus 5, your e is, sometimes it's connected to your natural log, but it might be second natural log. Uh, I get point zero zero four. Is that what y'all got? Point zero four. Yes, that's what that is correct. So this is equal to point zero four amps. So that means I'm almost fully discharged there, or fully charged rather, because my current has gone really low. But my total current then, after twenty seconds, is going to equal to three amps plus point zero four, or 3.04 amps. Okay? Listen, we're going to see capacitors a lot in upcoming chapters, but I uh, just want you to, to sort of be on task here with, with this one. Alright, we're going to see it sort of simply like this. Let's do another question similar to this. You know, we're going to skip this one. Skip this one all together. You can just draw a big X through it. All right, let's try this quick test. We're also going to, after you're done with this, if you want to go on to this other question, let's take this same circuit, and I want to know what is the charge equal to at a time of three seconds? What is the charge at a time of three seconds? So about five more seconds. Stop at 122, let's say. 122. Okay, good. C is the right answer. Let's see, some of you put D. You just got to watch your units. On this one, we had different units here. We had microfarads and microcoulombs. I forget the units of capacitance are in microfarads. I don't normally do that on tests, but I did on this one. But don't expect me to mix my units up. It's kind of nefarious. Uh, so here my time constant is one second. I know my time constant is equal to R times C. So one second is equal to 10 mega ohms times my capacitance. So my capacitance has to be 0.1 microfarads. Uh, if it's 0.1 microfarads, the micro and the mega cancel and that's equal to 1. All right, let's try this other question where I want to know what is the charge at t equal 3 seconds. Um, let's go, I'm going to pull up our equation sheet. Okay, for my equation sheet, um, you have these equations. Hmm. I thought I had more than that. Well, this is for, you need to know that this is for a charging capacitor. And this is for a discharging capacitor. Right, this exponential function is an increasing exponential function. And this is a decreasing exponential function. So if I plot them, they look like this. This one looks like this, which is for a charging capacitor. It's really only related to Q over T in the charging in charging scenario. This one is a discharging capacitor, and it looks like this. Also, this applies to I 
and v as well, where we would have, we wrote these earlier, but i would equal to i naught times e to the minus t over rc. All right, so in this case, we want to use this, this function, which describes the charge as a function of time. And I just plug in the right numbers, go back to that. So my charge at t equal three seconds is going to be equal to q times uh, 1 minus e to the minus t over rc. Putting in my values, q is equal to c times v. Uh, let's say this is 10 volts. So that's going to be uh, 0.1 microfarads times 10 volts times 1 minus e to the minus 3 over my time constant, which is 1 second. And I get uh, 1 microcoulomb times whatever that is. I get a uh, 0.95. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. 0 0.05, right? That 1 minus e to the minus uh, 3 over 1 is 0 0.05. Is that correct? Yes, you're right. 0.95. 1 minus 0 0.05. Excuse me. All right, so my charge then is going to be 0.95 microcoulombs. That makes sense because after three seconds, I've almost reached my, my 10 cal, which is 10 seconds. Right, so it's an exponential function, right? So it changes really rapidly. Uh, and so after three seconds, I should have a lot of my charge already on that capacitor, 0.95 microcoulombs. Test question would be similar to that. Something give you a time, tell me the charge of the current voltage. Mm -hmm. For RC, um, where did you get 15? 15. Is that 15 or is that 1? Yeah, that's a okay, pass. Yeah. That's a pass. <laughs> this right here, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's a pass. One second. Okay. Yeah. Is that clear enough? Yeah. All right. Okay. Any questions about those? Yeah, we're going to see uh, capacitors again in much greater depth, but just for now, we're okay with this. Kill one. Good? Fairly easy? Yeah. All right. Let's look at household circuits. You'll need to know a few things about household circuits. Uh, some of the safety features in a house, in their electrical system, and then also how a house is set up and the basic functions of, of the household circuit. In your house, you have three wires that come in off of a transformer. And these wires include two hot wires. These operate at plus 120 and minus 120 volts. And you also have a, uh, a neutral wire. All of these are going to go into uh, your meter box. And then those go into a circuit breaker. And then they go out into your house. Uh, remember, we talked about this transformer before. And later, when we get into AC electricity, we'll talk about how that transformer works by changing the magnetic field and different rates. You can ch you can either step up or step down. This happens to be a step down transformer. It takes your voltage in those lines outside your house. They are about 3,000 volts, and it steps it down to this plus or minus 120 volts. All right, everything in your house operates at about a 110 or 120. It depends how you think about the voltage but we'll just call it 120, except for some of your appliances, like your dryer and your, uh, like uh, maybe your hot water heater, or if you have electric heat in your house, those operate at what voltage? No, not 480. 220 or 240, yeah, depending on if you're thinking about 110 or 120. So they operate at twice the voltage of your regular appliances, and so whenever you plug those in, you're actually using both of these hot wires. Usually in your house, you only use one of them, but when you have a device that operates at 240 volts, 
it's really combining this plus and minus 120, and the difference between these two lines is going to be 240. So that's why you have that extra hot wire. Whereas if you didn't have the 240, you wouldn't need that extra hot wire. You'd just have the one hot wire and the neutral wire. All right. Uh, look something like this. These are your wires. So these are all coming in and off the street. So here's the uh, the power pole transformer here. You have these wires, the two hot wires that come in, and then you also have that neutral wire that comes in. Uh, there's usually a service head, or there is a service head outside of your house. It looks something like this. You've probably seen it. And those wires, those three wires, come into the service head. Uh, from the service head, they go straight into your meter. So those wires come into your meter here. That's that, you know, glass cover thing with the dial that spins around. You ever watch it? See how fast it spins? Yeah, so that's the dial that tells the electric company how much energy you've used. And then uh, that electricity all goes through your circuit box. And your circuit box or your circuit breaker has a bunch of switches in it where it separates all that electricity into a bunch of different circuits in your house. So each little switch is connected to a particular circuit in your house. And that circuit might, when you might have one circuit for your kitchen, or you might have another circuit for the lights in three of your bedrooms, uh, or you might have one for your bathroom. You probably have one separate just for your, say your stove or your electric heater or whatever. So this is just one, one circuit. But any house might have, you know, a dozen, two dozen circuits. The household circuit, if you notice, it comes off. These devices are all in parallel. So like, for example, this would be your radio. This would be your hair dryer. This would be your toaster or whatever. Whatever devices you have operating in your house. And the circuit is laid out in parallel. So two things are true. One is that all devices operate at the same voltage. And the other is that if you were, if you increase the number of devices, the total current goes up. Those are both things that we saw for parallel circuits, but they're true in your house too. That in a parallel circuit, every resistor has the same voltage. That was one of our basic rules. And then also, if you increase the number of resistors or the number of electrical devices that you have in your circuit, then that total current will increase. Now, the total current is the current that's going through this circuit breaker. So this switch, the current that goes through here, that is your total current. And as you add more and more resistors or more and more devices, the current going through that circuit breaker increases. So we have several safety features, the first of which is going to be that circuit breaker. You need to be able to identify, and you might even have a, a free response worth, you know, four or five points where I just ask you to describe one of these safety features in a couple of sentences. Describe what it does and how it works. So you need to know how each of these work and what each of them does. Uh, the three features are the circuit breaker. Or you might have a fuse in your house, but it does the same thing. It operates by a different principle, but it does the same thing. Uh, the circuit breaker grounding. This is that third prong on your on your electrical devices, on most or on a lot of your electrical devices. And uh, the GSCI, which is the ground fault circuit interrupt. You're probably familiar with all of these. You might not be familiar with how, how they work or what they do. You've probably seen them all there in your house. The circuit breaker, grounding, and then the GFCI, or sometimes it's called just a GFI. All right, can I go down? All right. OK, so the circuit breaker, it turn, a circuit breaker or a fuse turns a circuit off. Remember, you have a bunch of circuits in your house, but a single circuit breaker operates a single circuit. And it turns that circuit off 
if the current exceeds the safe capacity of the circuit. The total current exceeds the safe capacity of the circuit. So when they put the wires in your house, when they run those white or yellow wires through your walls that go to all your outlets, uh, those are rated for certain currents. They might be rated for 15 amps, or they might be rated for 20 amps, or they might be rated for 30 amps, or even 60 amps. But depending upon the rating for those wires, they'll put in a circuit breaker to match the rating. Because if you put too much current through those wires, they'll heat up, they'll melt the insulation, and then potentially cause a fire hazard. All right, so you have a, a safe capacity of current in each circuit, and that can be different for different circuits, but uh, it will match your circuit breaker. So it'll turn off if you exceed that safe capacity. Uh, most household circuit breakers will turn off if the current is uh, more than about 15 or 20 amps. Oh, not 115 or 20 amps. Here's a circuit breaker panel. You all circuit breakers in your house? You have this panel in your house? In our house, we have fuses, or we actually have fuses and circuit breakers, because our electrical system was, I think it's been slightly updated, but it was in the 50s when the house was built. And a fuse works a lot like a circuit breaker. A fuse looks like a light bulb, sort of. except it, it doesn't have the bulb in it. It has like this glass and case, glass casing on the top. This is from the side. If you look at it from the top, it's a round, win, a round usually, usually has this glass window in it. And inside the glass window, you have a metal tab. All right, and that metal tab is actually what the current goes through. If you get too much current, that metal tab will break. You ever seen a fuse before, like a fuse in a house? Yeah, sometimes you have uh, fuses that look like shotgun shells, too, and those are usually for higher currents. So that might be for like 60 or 30 amps for use for your dryer or even used for like a main shutoff fuse. You do have a main breaker in some of your newer houses that'll look like this, and that main breaker shuts off your house from the, uh, the electricity outside. So have y'all ever, um, you're not supposed to do this, but have you ever when you've lost electricity during a hurricane, you take your generator and you make a wire that has nail plugs on both ends, and then you plug one end into the generator and then one into your wall. Y'all done that? Yeah, you're not supposed to do it, but if you do do it, you need to always turn off this main breaker handle. So what that does is your generator produces electricity and it will send electricity into your outlets and it'll energize that particular circuit. So it's nice, like if you have a ceiling fan that you want to run, and it's on the same circuit as a wall outlet, you can plug in your generator to the wall outlet, crank up your generator, and you energize that whole circuit. So you can run your ceiling fan, or you can run your, your window unit, your air conditioner, or whatever. Um, but the problem is that people, if people come and try to work on the lines outside your house, then your house is actively sending out current to the lines outside your house to the transformer and uh, it can hurt people that are working on the lines. So you should always turn off this main breaker handle. If you don't have that handle, you might have a set of fuses that will turn off the electricity to your house. That separates it from the system outside. All right, um, there are other reasons not to do that. If you don't really know what you're doing, you shouldn't do it. All right, um, here's a circuit breaker. They have two different types. This is kind of an older type. It's a bimetallic strip. In this older type, it's a bimetallic strip. The current, let's see, where's the current? It comes in one place, goes through this bimetallic strip, and then goes through. Yeah, you know, when it's closed, it goes through here. When it's open, it doesn't go through. Now, the bimetallic strip, you have two metals that are welded together. If you heat them up, they'll expand but one of the metals will expand at a greater rate than the other metal. And that'll cause that bimetallic strip to bend one way or the other. So if you send a current that's too big through this bimetallic strip, it causes it to bend one direction or the other, and it'll flip the switch. Usually those circuit breakers look like this. We'll get into electromagnetic switches in the next chapter. It's like a solenoid switch, where you have an electromagnet and a permanent magnet. You run a current through the electromagnet, if your current exceeds a certain amount, 
it'll open up the switch. You will have a magnet for cell at half on that low exo magnet. All right, so this is mostly how uh, ours work today by this electro, this solenoid switch we call it. We'll see that in the next chapter. This, this is the just a, a schematic of what that circuit breaker looks like with the electromagnetic switch. You run a current through this. If you get enough current, you get an interaction of these magnetic fields that causes it to open up the switch. All right, let's try this little quick test. When people design circuits for your house, they have to design them so that when you have everything operating on your switch on your circuit, that you're not exceeding the safe capacity of the circuit. In older houses, uh, they don't usually account for enough electricity, and so you get all your devices plugged in, and you'll kick a circuit breaker. So in this question, let's try to figure out, we have a 1,200-watt heater, a light bulb, and a radio, and everything's humming along just fine, but then you add in your almost 500-watt television, and the circuit breaker kicks off because you've exceeded the safe capacity of the circuit. Uh, what is the safe capacity for this circuit breaker? You'll need to find the current for all the devices using our power expression and then figure out at what point does the circuit breaker actually turn off. Remember our power expression, P equals VI. So if I wanted to find the current for this, what is the current for the 1200 watt heater? What current is it for? 10 is right. Right. So I have 1200 divided by 120 volts, which is my voltage, uh, P over V. So that device pulls 10 amps quite a lot. Not much in your house pulls that much current. Figure out for the light bulb and the radio. And then when you add on that television, it kicks off the circuit breaker. So somewhere between those three things plus adding in that fourth thing is where a circuit breaker kicks off is its maximum rated current. Let's do about 10, more, 10 or 15 more seconds. I'm going to stop at 320. 320. Okay, good. C is right. Awesome. Did I tell you all the octopus joke? Have I told you that? Did I? How many times do you have to tickle an octopus to make him laugh? Okay. Ten. Ten tickles. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite 90 percent, but I've been holding that joke for a while. So. All right, so here we have 10 amps. Um, I have one amp on my light bulb. I have one amp for my radio. And I have four amps for my television. In each case, I just do the power divided by 120. So I have 10 plus 1 plus 1. That's equal to 12. So I'm doing just fine with 12 amps. But then I add in this extra four amps. 
and I have 16 amps. So somewhere between 12 and 16, my circuit breaker kicks off. And the only number here that I have between 12 and 16 is 15. All right. Okay, let's look at grounding. This was added, our house doesn't have this because our house was built in the 50s, but if you have a house that was built after the 60s, if you go out and you look at your service head on your house or look at your meter, so you have your service head that comes into your house, you know, those wires come into it, and then down here you're going to have your meter probably just underneath the service head. And then if you look, uh, there will be a thin copper wire that comes off and goes into a, a rod that looks like this that's driven deep into the ground. You might not even be able to see the rod. You might, if you just sort of push away the grass or whatever, you'll be able to see it. But there'll be a copper wire, a bare copper wire that goes down to the ground and is attached to this, this brass rod. Uh, this ground wire connects the rod uh, to your house. And this grounding serves a couple purposes. Uh, one of the purposes, this is not the most important, but it's to protect your house from lightning strikes. My grandmother, the grandmother, she made up all sorts of stories. So I don't know if this is true or not. It might be a lie. But she used to talk about how she came home one day and they had a really bad electrical storm and uh, uh, the uh, elect the uh, lightning struck either the house or struck the electrical lines outside, and the lightning the produces current that went into her house. And she talks about how she would come into her living room and the TV just sort of exploded and started dancing around. <coughs> that was probably a lie, but there is actually a real problem that if you're not grounded, if your house isn't grounded that you can have a, a lightning strike and that will cause electricity to come in and energize every part of your electrical system in your house. Does that happen to you? Uh, so oh, yeah. He was okay, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, this is a way to protect from that because it basically grounds your entire electrical system. If we look at our house, you know, we have all these wires that are running through the, through the house, but we have this ground wire that is outside our house. So if lightning strikes, this is a lightning strike, if it strikes our house, that electricity will go straight down into that ground wire and it'll leave our house all completely uh, safe. So that's one reason, but the primary reason that we have this grounding is to protect users from faulty devices. And so you'll see on many of your electrical devices that you'll have not two prongs, but you'll have three prongs. And on our outlets and newer houses, uh, you have this third prong right here. This third prong directly connects you to that ground wire that goes outside your house. There's hardly ever, only if you have some problem, is there ever any electricity that goes to that third prong. And now you can take a paper clip and stick it into that third prong. It not even do anything. All it does is connect you to the, uh, to the ground wire outside of your house. I would recommend that you do that because sometimes electricians get things mixed up. I mean, they don't normally get that one mixed up. Uh, but in fact, you know, remember we have two wires or three wires rather that are connected that come in. One of them is that plus 120, that hot wire that goes through our outlet. The other one, the other flat spade looking prong, what does that one go to? So let me draw a picture actually. We'll get to this in just a second. Unless you have a picture over here. So these look like this. Uh, one of these, this is our plus 120. What is this one? What does this prong go to in our electrical system? There you have those three wires that come into your house. What were they? We had the plus 120, the minus 120, and then what else? Uh, yeah, the ground or the neutral. We'll call it a neutral. It is a ground wire, but we'll call it a neutral wire just to differentiate it from that, that brass rod outside your house. So this one 
is that third wire that comes in from the street. It's that neutral wire. And then here, this is the ground. This is that brass rod that's that's uh, that's stuck in the ground outside your house. So if the electrician has, has wired it up correctly, you can take a paper clip and stick it in here. It wouldn't hurt you. Now if you stuck it in here, you would get a shock because this is actually the hot wire and the electricity from here would flow out of here through your paper clip and into your body and down to the ground. So I would recommend putting a paper clip into it. But definitely here with the ground, this goes directly into the uh, that grass right outside your house. So it does the long It's supposed to be a long one, if I understand it. I'm not an electrician. That's that's what I think. Is that true, John? It's supposed to be the long one. <laughs> but sometimes they don't always get them hooked up right, so I wouldn't put anything in the, the flat parts. But you can definitely put it in the round hole. Okay, so this third prong offers a uh, offers a path, a direct path to the uh, grounding rod outside your house. And this is useful if you have a device that's faulty. I have a picture on the next page. Let me show you. So let's say you have this electrical appliance, a toaster, or whatever. Computers often have a have a third prong. Uh, and if you ever open up the inside of your computer case, you'll see that there's a green wire that leads from like the chassis of the computer to the case of the computer. You ever seen that? There's like a little screw that connects a green wire on the inside of your computer case. That green wire goes directly to that third prong on your outlet. Uh, so if you imagine your appliance, everything operates just fine. You have electricity that comes in here, it goes through here, and then it comes out here. And that green wire is never used unless you have some problem. If you have a problem, say something, you have a wire that's broken inside, you have your current that comes in here, goes through here, and instead of completing the circuit, it actually comes to the outer case and it charges this entire case until somebody comes along and touches it. And then that electricity will go through you and into the ground. However, if you have this, this uh, grounding wire, instead of going through you, instead that electricity will come out. It'll take that easier path because it's much lower resistance to go out to that brass rod than it is to go through you. So what this does is if you have a faulty device or you have a wire that's broken inside the device, then it just allows another path for that current to go out. All right, so the, the third prong offers an alternate place for that electricity to flow. You need to know how it works and what it does to be able to describe it in one or two sentences. All right, let's check this out. Third prong provides which of these? Stop at 30. Okay, awesome. A is right. Uh, it provides an alternate ground. It's not any of these other things. All right. Um, you know, when you have a bladder infection, I never had a bladder infection actually, but if you have a bladder infection, you know what? You're in trouble. Sorry, that's a little crude humor for the morning. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, so now let's look at the ground fault circuit interrupt, and I think this is our last thing. Uh, this is the GFCI, or sometimes it's called the GFI. This is usually found on an outlet or in the plug of certain devices like hair dryers. Think in your house, where do you find the GFI? It looks like uh, it looks like this, where you have a normal outlet, but then you have those two little buttons like this and reset. Bathroom. You find it in the bathroom. Where else do you find it? Kitchen often, not always. Where else? Yeah, you see them outside too. Right. So you see them in bathrooms and kitchens and outside. What do those areas all have in common? Right. They're all prone to be wet. Your bathroom, your 
kitchen, outside. These are all areas that are prone to be wet. And uh, the GFCI consists of a very sensitive ammeter. Remember, an ammeter measures, gosh, what does it measure? It measures current, right. So it has a very sensitive ammeter. And if at any point I in exceeds I out, then the GFCI will turn off in a very short amount of time. Uh, if you imagine, like, let's do the side profile of this outlet. I have a wire coming in, and then I have a wire going out. This is our hot wire. This is our neutral wire. That's the two wires, the two flat parts of our outlet. And the ammeter in there measures each of these currents. This is going to be I in. This will be I out. If I in ever exceeds I out, if the ingoing current is bigger than the outgoing current, what does that tell you? What's happening? Right, current is going somewhere it shouldn't be going because all the current that comes in should come back out again. And so if you're losing current in your circuit, then, you know, that's very, very bad because usually it means that the current is going through you into the wet ground where your resistance has been decreased. And so if this value ever exceeds this value, it goes off. So know that it's a very sensitive ammeter and know that it has that criterion where if I in is bigger than I out, it switches off. Students often confuse this with circuit breakers because they are kind of similar. The circuit breaker is also a switch that turns off, but the circuit breaker turns off if it exceeds a certain value, 15 amps, 20 amps, 30 amps, whatever it is. This isn't a particular value. This is just what is the difference in these two? And if ever, ever the difference is bigger than zero, then it's going to uh, turn off. All right, a couple quicker questions. Let's try this one, then we'll wrap up after these, just the end of this chapter. <coughs> All right, I'll stop at uh, 25. We get at uh, 825, right? 825. All right, good. A is right. See, I warned you, students often get confused this with a circuit breaker. And so this is our GFCI. This is our circuit breakers. So make sure that you get those two separate in your minds. GFCI, this is circuit breaker. This is the uh, that, the grounding, that third prong. And this is, this is circuit. Which of these statements about a household circuit is true? I'll stop at 35, or I think go to 38. All right, so we're a little spread out here. Uh, one is correct. The household circuit is a parallel circuit. All devices in a household circuit operate at the same current. That's not true, but how can I make that statement true? I can make it voltage instead. They all operate at the same voltage. The current is going to be different for every device. It'll depend upon the, the overall resistance of the device. Uh, so that's not correct. Three, as you add more devices to a household circuit, the potential across each device, remember, not correct. Parallel circuits, every device operates at the same voltage. So the potential across each device is constant. And four, the circuit breaker turns off if that criterion is met. It's not a circuit breaker, it's a what? Right, GFCI or GFI. So two, three, and four are all incorrect. Uh, so A is the right answer. Again, be prepared for some multiple choice questions like that, and then also be prepared to just describe one of those three devices. 
may or may not have a free response question that would be worth you know, three to five points. Um, also, we are going to carry on with chapter, well, chapter six, I guess. Chapter six up next. Uh, yeah. On the next test, we will have a small portion of it, but it's going to be like one of those things where I tell you, all right, you're just going to have this one little part, and sort of focus on that one little part, and I'll tell you exactly what the questions like will work in the class. You're going to have to do a cross product for the force on the moving charge or a But we'll do that on Monday until we all set to be prepared to start preparing for that. All right, y'all, have a great day. Do well in your quant if you have quant this morning. I'll see y'all um, Monday.